Well, good afternoon to everyone. It is really great to be back in the Boston area. I grew up in Milton and in Braintree, and for the last decade, have been in our nation's capital. So coming back home, so to speak, is really wonderful. So thank you for the opportunity to the Ad Club, and thank you all. I've been really enjoying myself this afternoon listening to some very provocative uh, discussion. Uh, today, I hope that we will have an opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about uh, things that have happened to our world uh, in a post 9-11 frame. I think that the lead up by Anna, uh, by Ellen, and certainly by the awardee today uh, is a perfect tee up for the conversation I want to have with you today. Uh, you heard in the description as I came up the stage that I am the former special representative to Muslim communities at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, this is the first time in American history that our country had that position. I want to tell you how I got that position um, and what I've been doing for the last few years in Washington. Um, and then I want to open it up for Q&A, and they've allowed me to take a few questions. So be thinking about that as we have this conversation. Um, one of the things I want to tell you about is me. Um, the reason I want to do that is to give you the frame of who I was before 9-11 happened, um, so that you can understand for yourselves why I was called to action to serve our country. Uh, I was not born in America, I was born in northern India, uh, and I came to the United States when I was a baby. I grew up uh, in Milton and in Braintree, Massachusetts, uh, and went to a private school outside of Boston called Milton Academy, K through 12. Uh, I went to Smith College in western Massachusetts, and I did my education in graduate school at the Fletcher School. So I am from Massachusetts, and I'm proud to be here, yes, indeed. <laughs> The navigation that brought me from Massachusetts to Washington is a really extraordinary one that I feel very blessed to have had a privilege to meet um, firsthand uh, what I would call a, a major transformative experience based on a really terrible experience. Um, when I was in college, uh, and I am 46 years old, so just to give you a perspective, uh, in the spring of my junior year at Smith College, on the, on the back heels of a very complicated year in American history from 88 to 89, those of you who will remember, our country was going through a lot vis-a-vis uh, -vis race in America. And you will remember that on college campuses from the West Coast to the East Coast, there were all kinds of racial incidents that were happening. In fact, uh, there was a cross burning at Amherst College. There was something that happened at Yale. And at my college campus, Smith College, uh, there was a racial incident that happened. A woman of color had a note placed on her door, on her dorm room door, that was, in fact, one of the most vile things I have ever read in my life. Uh, I had just been elected student body president in the spring of my junior year, and I had to deal with a racial, racially charged emotional campus. Uh, and it was a very hard thing to do as a young woman, but more importantly, it made me think a lot about what it meant to have a community of diverse people who care a lot about each other and have values that support dignity, that support respect, that support compassion. And I tell you this story because it was in my mind as I began my senior year of college. And the tradition at Smith College is that the president of the student body open up the school year with an opening convocation. So in the fall of 1989, I knew I had to give a speech. And I knew that I wanted to give a speech about that horrible incident that had happened a few months before. So the speech was about diversity. It was about dignity for all. But what I didn't know at the time, uh, as I was developing this speech, that my college was going to invite an important guest to come uh, be part of that ceremony. And the important guest was the First Lady of the United States, Barbara Bush. And she came to Massachusetts to great fanfare in the time before Google, before Facebook, before emails. And so it was a, it was a very... Uh, a different kind of context than we would expect today if our First Lady arrived uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. And we had state senators from, from Massachusetts and, and surrounding states, as well as college presidents from all over the Commonwealth of Massachusetts come to Smith to, to, to meet the First Lady of the United States. While I had an extraordinary experience being able to meet with her that day, I knew I had to give a speech about the importance of diversity and the importance of dignity for all, because I wanted to start our school year on the right foot. So I gave a speech about diversity. And the next day, the White House called. And they said, Farah, Mrs. Bush really liked your speech. We're wondering if we can have a copy of it. She would like to use it. 
My senior year in college was an extraordinary one in this remarkable way. Mrs. Bush and I had a correspondence by letter, um, and I'm gonna, you're going to see themes, I think, of some of the speakers before me, the importance of the written word. She hand wrote letters to me, and I hand wrote letters back to her all year, my senior year. Uh, and she was very kind to me, and in, in April of my senior year, I wrote a note to her, and I said, Mrs. Bush, what advice do you have to give to a graduating senior? And Mrs. Bush wrote back, and she said, Farah, I don't know where the jobs are or how to get them but why don't you come to the White House and meet with me and my chief of staff, which I did. Um, this is the reason I got my first job out of college. Uh, I had an extraordinary privilege of serving our country uh, in a, a, a very special way. I served uh, in the US Agency for International Development my first job out of college as a political appointee in the Bush administration, I didn't even know what a political appointee was. I had not worked on any campaigns. I didn't know anything about it, but she was kind to me. She never asked me who, where I was born. She never asked me what party I was from. She didn't ask me what race I was or what religion I was. She listened to my words that day in the fall of 1989 and liked what I had to say. Now, I tell you that story because 20 years from that date, another First Lady of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton, also heard my words and offered me a position to serve as the special representative to Muslim communities. It isn't often that you can hear uh, someone on a stage, especially in a state like this, talk about the importance of not having a political affiliation that ties you down. But I was a political appointee in the Bush, the George W. Bush administration, and I was a political appointee in the Obama administration up until January 31st of this year. How did this happen, and what was I doing? Well, after graduate school, and I had left for graduate school after three years uh, working at the U.S. Agency for International Development to get my master's degree in international affairs at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, where I studied counterinsurgency, and I studied uh, international security studies, and I was really engaged and very interested in, in global affairs. And I think that's because my family was from northern India, and every summer I would leave for summer vacation and go visit my grandfather and my cousins and my aunts and my uncles. And I had this idea every summer I, that the world was bigger than just here. So it's not funny and not unusual that I would go and get a master's degree in this, and I had been very interested in development work, but when I got to the Fletcher School, I didn't study anything about development. I was really interested in the ideas around counterinsurgency. I was really interested in radicalization. I was really interested in international security studies. So I did my work there, and I decided to stay in the Boston area, where I worked for the consulting affiliate of a law firm named Mintz Levin. The consulti consulting affiliate is ML Strategies, and I was the second employee at ML Strategies at the time, and spent time working on international business, and loved it. I had a great time. My family was in Massachusetts, my friends were in Massachusetts, and I was really loving it. And then on a perfect sunny day uh, in September of 2001, um, our country was attacked. And I remember uh, being on the 41st floor of one financial center, uh, looking out at Logan Airport, and thinking with this very deep fear uh, and sadness, I really hope that whatever happened here doesn't at all touch anything to do with the religion of Islam. Well. We discovered in the three or four days after 9-11 that there was a terrorist group called Al-Qaeda that claimed the religion of Islam incorrectly and used their poisonous ideology to radicalize people to do that violent thing. And I remember walking into my boss's office and saying, Steve, I love working here and Massachusetts is home, but some guy named Osama bin Laden has defined my country and has defined my religion and I can't sit here in Massachusetts and not serve. You have to help me get back to Washington. The law firm of Mintz Levin and ML Strategies worked together, both the Republicans and the Democrats at that company, to find a way to bring Farah to Washington. And in that bipartisan way, I moved, it took two years because I hadn't worked on the George W. Bush campaign, but I came back into government and I said, I didn't care what I did, all I know is that I need to serve. And I was passionate about pushing back against a poisonous ideology that was defining our country and defining my religion. And I worked in Washington thinking, 
in the, in, the, in the time that I was there, I was going to be there for a couple of years, and then I'd come back to Massachusetts. But that's not what happened. Um, I had the extraordinary privilege of serving our country at the National Security Council uh, at the White House, where I was working on issues of ideology and, and radicalization and Muslim engagement in, in many different forms uh, at the NSC. And when I was there, something happened that most of you, I think, will remember. Can I just see a, a, a put your hand up if you remember what the Danish cartoon crisis is? I think most of you remember that. So that was in 2006, and when that happened, our country was unprepared. Something that happened in Copenhagen affected a life in Kabul. And we did not understand in 2006 that that kind of pace was going to happen. But remember, the internet was moving fast. Ideas were ricocheting around the world. And people were understanding that the loudest voice was taking hold of a narrative that was impacting generations around the globe. When the Danish cartoon crisis happened, I was asked to go to Denmark and Belgium and Netherlands with the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe, who wanted me to talk to them about what we were thinking about vis-a-vis -vis Muslim engagement around the world and how we were thinking about building communities. I was really shocked when I got to Europe because I hadn't studied Europe at Fletcher. I had focused on the Middle East and I had focused on South Asia and I was all of a sudden hearing this ideology of an us and a them which echoed very sharply in conjunction with an ideology of Al-Qaeda, by the way, of an us and a them. President Obama has said there is no us and them, there's just an us. And that narrative of an us and them is poisonous in whatever form we take whether it's on a college campus or whether it's on Boylston Street. So what happened in 2007 is that I joined the Department of State where I was asked to work with our embassies across Europe to develop engagement strategies with Muslims across Europe because we did not want to be unprepared as we were when the Danish cartoon crisis happened. And I learned a lot. I traveled all over Europe and listened to what communities were saying about how this us and them mentality impacted them. And I seeded many initiatives that were built off of what I heard on the ground from people who said, we need to be able to do this, and can the US government do that? And I recognized that the strength of the US government was to be the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner with the ideas that we heard on the ground. We had to catalyze narratives that were going to push back against the extremist narrative of an us and a them. How do you do that? Well, you go deep, and you go wide, and you give dignity to all voices. You begin to unpeel very, very basic things. When you talk about a community, you don't look at it as a monolith. You go inside, and you say, for example, the country of Spain. What are Muslims in Spain doing? Well, my answer to that is which part of Spain and which generation are you talking about? In Barcelona, you cannot build a mosque. And 40,000 people in Barcelona are of, excuse me, 80,000 people are of Pakistani origin, 40% of which are, under, uh, are only single males. In Madrid, you can build a mosque. In fact, the largest mosque in Europe is in Madrid. So when you are asking what's happening with Muslims in Spain, I say to you, where do you mean? What do you mean? What do we know as the US government in terms of what's happening community to community? I also unleashed initiatives that had to do with women because I understood that what was happening in the home mattered. And I thought a lot uh, with my colleagues at the Department of State and at the National Security Council of the strength of women in a household and began to think about American models where women have actually changed the course of things. For example, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Now, MAD is an incredible grassroots organization that with the catalyzation of regular people on the ground was able to infect across America an idea about the importance of being sober while you drive. And we began to think what happens if we get women to unleash their power to push back against extremism? And we began to understand that using the strength of the US government as the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner by seeding ideas with partners that made a difference on the ground, we could build initiatives that were credible, credible voices, as opposed to the US government, which I'm sorry to say, when you're pushing back against Al Qaeda of any government on Earth, 
is not a credible source. Who are the credible voices? We unleashed initiatives that were built on what we knew were going to make a difference. We seeded something called the Sisters Against Violent Extremism, S-A-V-E, SAVE. It is the only organization of its kind in the world. We did many things like that, and I was ready to leave in 2009 when President Bush was no longer going to be president, and a gentleman named Barack Obama had just been appointed, elected uh, to be president. And I, I was on my way out when the new Secretary of State asked for a briefing on things that, uh, that she was wanting to sort of learn about uh, regionally. And I was asked to come to the briefing on Europe to tell her stories about what I had seen on the ground in Europe, what was happening with 44 million Muslims across Western Europe and the importance of community. And in that meeting, in that briefing, um, I had other colleagues there as well. And this was her first, uh, her first briefing on Europe. And I remember very, very sharply thinking to myself, why am I here? There are other things going on. There's NATO, there's Russia, there's a gas pipeline. There's a whole bunch of things. She's not going to be focusing on Muslims in Europe. And I knew we only had 60 minutes for this. And so I sort of waited and, and listened to my other colleagues uh, talk about various things. And this was Hillary Clinton, so people were talking. And at 45 minutes, Secretary Clinton stopped the meeting and she said, you know, we're going to have time to go into a lot of detail on all of this, but I want to make sure that everybody that came to the room today has a chance to speak. That is an extraordinary thing to do, I will tell you. And she leaned over to me and she said, Farah, why are you here? And I said, Madam Secretary, and then I started telling her what I'm telling you about the changes that were happening in Europe and the in increase of an ideological uh, power that was pushing into a space with young Muslims in Europe that was infecting the way they thought about themselves, questioning their identity. What does it mean to be modern and Muslim? What's the difference between culture and religion? And the more I talked, the more Secretary Clinton moved forward. And her eyes were really large, and my boss was standing right next to her, sitting right next to her, and he said, Madam Secretary, when Farah leaves, and she puts her hand on Dan's arm and she pushes him back and she says to me, where are you going? And there was pin drop silence in the room and I was really, you know, oh my gosh. And I said, well, Madam Secretary, and I told her where I was going to be going the following week. And she looked at me and she said, we will see about that. And she did. Uh, the next day they called me and they said, we are asking what it will take to keep you here. And I said, when the Secretary of State asks you to serve your nation, you salute. And I'm telling you that story because you need to know that the things that I've done as special representative are not about me. They're about the vision that our country was putting forward. Secretary Clinton never asked me anything about the fact that I had served in the first Bush administration in the early 90s. She never asked me about serving as George w. in the George W. Bush administration. She heard what I had to say. It has been an honor and a pleasure to serve my country for the last decade. And as of a few weeks ago, I was in government. I'm at Harvard right now uh, at the Institute of Politics where Anna was talking about um, to sort of catalyze and think through some of the experiences I've had in the last five and a half years as the special representative. I want to use my final time to tell you just some bullet points on what I saw as special representative. I traveled to more than 80 countries around the world. And what Secretary Clinton asked me to do was to focus on three things. One, to understand importantly the importance of the global concept of Muslims around the world. That we are not a monolith. Muslims are not just one thing, that they're diverse. That their ideas, like I talked about Spain and Barcelona, that a Muslim in Suriname is as Muslim as a Muslim in Stockholm, as a Muslim in Surabaya, Indonesia and that we had to give dignity to all voices, so community matters. The second part of my job was to focus on young people. One-fourth of our planet is Muslim, 1.6 billion people. 62% of that number is under the age of 30. These are digital natives. These are young people who grew up in a post-9-11 world where the loudest voices that they hear are those of the extremists, and they are asking questions. Who am I? What's the difference, as I said, between culture and religion? When you think about the narratives on Boylston Street with those two young men, you heard a lot about identity. 
who they thought they were and what they thought they were supposed to do. The impact of 9-11 for this slice of humanity has been severe. Every single day since September 12, 2001, they have seen the word Islam or Muslim on the front page of a paper, online and offline. They're asking questions that their parents and their grandparents never asked. And they're having to navigate through this at the same time that the extremists are blaring out what they believe you're supposed to do if you call yourself a Muslim. This is a terrifying data point to tell you. But I did my job as special representative because I knew and I still know and I absolutely believe that we can overcome the narrative of the extremists. How? Because there are more people with credible voices than there are of them. That there are more Muslims and non-Muslims in the world who can catalyze movements to push back against the extremists. The question I ask myself is, why haven't we done more? So, I had a global mandate. I was focusing on youth. And the third part is I was supposed to listen. People to people engagement. There are many people in our government, at the State Department for sure, who work on a government to government level. But I was doing the work of people to people. So I was going to community centers and schools, talking to hip hop artists and social entrepreneurs and everybody in between to hear their stories about what it meant to be on the planet as a Muslim youth today, because I knew that their ideas were the, were the ideas that were going to spark the seeds to grow things that would be able to push back against Al Qaeda and its affiliates. So in telling you this story, I want you to think about your roles. I don't think many of you in this audience actually work on countering violent extremism. But you have a role to play, too. This isn't about what governments are supposed to be doing. This is about what we are supposed to be doing as human beings on this planet. We can eradicate this. And what's your role? I was going to ask you to close your eyes for a minute. And when I say to you, please close your eyes, when I say Muslim and when I say woman, what's the image you have in your head? OK, open your eyes. She doesn't look like me, does she? I want you to think about the stereotypes and the sound bites that you hear on TV and the things that we do in pop culture, to tell stories that are diverse to not go to the automatic place, which is what we're doing in America, which is when you describe Muslims, and certainly Muslim women, you think victim. Think about the power of the voices out there and the ability to share the diversity of the stories out there. What are Muslim women asking me around the world? They are in an identity crisis. So are Muslim men. But what the power of the woman is, is that they're the ones who are raising the children. And they need to have the, the tools in their toolbox to be able to navigate this so that they teach children to grow with compassion, that they don't ask about an us and a them, that they understand that you can be modern and Muslim, that you can have ideas across the spectrum, some more conservative, some not, that's not our place, but that we can all push back against violent extremism. Whether you're catalyzing an initiative or a movement, the things that you're doing in your daily jobs, in the advertising and media fields, which I believe the majority of you are doing today, you have a role to play in the way we hear the stories, that we understand and absorb the narrative. What I ask you to do today, a few weeks before the one-year anniversary of the bombing on Boylston Street, is to think about the role we all can play in telling new stories, in pushing back against extremist ideology, and understanding that you have power that they don't, and that you too can catalyze and affect change. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you today. I have been allowed to take two questions, which I'd like to do if anybody has uh, any questions. I don't think so then. OK. Um, thank you all very, very much. And have a very nice rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye.